on how the youth climate movement is redefining activism and action. My name is Kira Stoll, and I'm the Chief Sustainability and Carbon Solutions Officer at the University of California, Berkeley. And I'm really pleased to be here today um, moderating uh, this panel discussion. Uh, my work focuses on fostering a culture of sustainability at UC Berkeley and the UC system and with our partners. With a shared creative focus, I work with faculty, staff, students, leadership to develop and implement real solutions from decarbonizing our energy systems to eliminating single use plastic to building and renovating green buildings and importantly, creating an equitable and inclusive environmental movement. And aligned with today's talk, I believe it's critically important for educational institutions like Berkeley to lead and particularly for our students to drive innovation and change. Students helped to birth Berkeley's contemporary sustainability movement. And today they are at the forefront of the effort to accelerate our use of renewable energy and address climate change. I want to start off by thanking Grounded and Bank of the West for helping bring together such a fantastic panel. Grounded is a great organization working to identify and advance scalable climate crisis solutions to ensure a thriving planet. And Bank of the West is a financial services company that is redefining banking for a more sustainable future and is a longtime partner of ours at UC Berkeley. So let's get started. According to NASA, globally, 2020 was the hottest year on record, effectively tying 2016, the previous record. And in recent weeks, we've seen extreme weather swings all over the world and in places like Texas and the Middle East. The science is ever more clear that there is a connection between climate disruption and making weather extremes like this more likely and higher risk. With almost every nation in the world, including the US again, engaged in the climate accord, the Paris Climate Accord, we know the climate crisis is happening here and now and a collective solutions are required. Today, we have assembled a group of climate activists to discuss how youth leaders are deploying a new playbook to enact systemic change and ensure a livable planet. Right now, for future generations, and how they can support and empower youth to redefine activism and action in climate. So for our attendees throughout the conversation, please utilize the Q&A box uh, to the right side of your screen. We have secure time at the end for audience Q&A and would love to hear from you. So please do use that Q&A box. And now let's get the conversation started. Today, I'm joined by Kevin J. Patel, a youth climate activist dedicated to fighting for climate justice, having founded initiatives like the LA's first Youth Climate Commission, as well as One Up Action, an organization that has tasked itself, itself with implementing direct actions within marginalized communities. Welcome, Kevin. Our second panelist. I was just saying, Dr. thanks for having me. Ah. Wonderful. Our second panelist, Vassar Seidel, who among other roles is now the Deep Sea Mining Campaign Director at the Oxygen Project, an organization working to raise awareness and defend the ecosystems that produce our oxygen. Welcome Vassar. Thank you so much, Kira, and everyone for having me. And we have Lehua, Kumulo, the Voyaging Director of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. The Voyaging Society provides an inspiring example of how indigenous knowledge, culture, science, and values can intersect to create a healthy, thriving future for the Earth. So now we're going to get into our questions and conversations with our panelists. And again, like I said, we're going to have a time for Q&A at the end, so do participate in that panel box on the side. So let's start with Kevin and Vassar. I have a question for you. You're both on the front lines of the climate movement. 
How do you think today's youth are using their platforms to drive action in solving the climate cross crisis? And do you see any evolutions in this activism? And, and if so, how? So since I see Vassar up on the screen now, why don't we start with you? I was actually gonna let uh, Kevin go first because the work he does is amazing and uh, he really is on the front lines. Um, right. He's his story, which I've, I've no Kevin. So I've heard his story before and, and it's pretty amazing. Um, and he was inspired from living um, and being on the front lines. I have a little bit different of a story and uh, I, I come from a, a family and I, I come from a place where I, I want to actually be able to say I'm on the front lines of the climate crisis. Um, I do work to lift up people's voices who are on the front lines. And I think that that's a, a big distinction. Um, but I, I do think that there has been an evolution in climate activism and it's been forced a little bit upon us by uh, the pandemic and also uh, just the, all of the things that have happened over 2020 and continue in 2021. But we've seen uh, youth in particular being uh, the best and the best fit for adapting to these challenging times um, with the tools at our fingertips. And uh, one of those things is digital media. And it's something that the Oxygen Project had uh, done before uh, the pandemic and before the climate crisis, but it's taking activism online, uh, changing the narrative of social media, changing the narrative really around climate too, to be, um, yes, focusing on carbon, but also focusing on oxygen. And those same ecosystems that are being destroyed and creating uh, more carbon in our atmosphere are also the same ecosystems that produce our world's oxygen. And that is something that really relates to people and can even onboard people into climate action uh, is, you know, really our belief. And then what's really happened in this time is how do we create tools for people to take action or create information for people to be inspired um, and to plug in to the climate movement. And that's exactly what we've done at the Oxygen Project. That's what we're doing with the Deep Sea Bed Mining campaign. We, re we released that campaign in August. So we've done that um, during this time with all digital tools um, and all information, just trying to get people to find out about it uh, through social media and through online platforms. Something else I've seen with uh, the youth climate movement is creativity, whether that's the different uh, platforms on social media or actually uh, finding creative and artistic ways to communicate the climate emergency that isn't necessarily um, always depressing or uh, you know too overloaded with information. And one of those examples uh, is with our deep sea bed mining campaign, we join efforts with a lo-fi music label and we created an album that celebrates the ocean. Uh, a lot of people maybe haven't even been to the ocean, but they especially haven't been to the deep sea. And these artists donated songs that uh, really inspired them and made them make, make you feel like you've been in, in the ocean. So it's an extension of our deep sea bed mining campaign. And that's just one example of how youth are being able to inspire but also drive action at the same time in creative ways uh, that might have not been explored before the pandemic. Thank you. Thanks, Vassar. And Kevin, would you please share your thoughts? Yeah, of course. And I just want to thank Vassar for her extensive answer on you know the evolution of the youth climate movement. She is right. It has been extensive with the creative and social media platforms. I will also say that you know um, with all of that. Uh, being in the movement for 10 years, I've seen such a huge change. We've, we went from, you know, systematic action, which we're still doing, but we are now in the evolution of young people really implementing solutions, uh, whether that be in policy, whether that be actually in science, right? And creating these solutions that are going to make uh, solving these issues, these, you know, these disparities, these injustices, and these inequalities that are happening to communities of color uh, and to communities worldwide. 
Uh, and so th that is one way that I see the climate movement, as, you know, the youth climate movement has really transitioned is that not only are we striking, not only are we marching or uh, doing rallies and protests and, uh, you know, our systematic action, but we're actually going ahead and doing that individual action and really creating these solutions to solve these issues. Um, and I know for a lot of young people, a lot of young people have not only creating the solutions, you know, uh, but they're also, uh, you know, the world leaders and the, the politicians of today. So again, that goes back into policy. So policy, science, and as well, we continue with our systema systematic action because, you know, uh, we have to have both so that we can get a just world. But that's how I see how the youth movement has really transitioned in, um, into a new evolution of the movement. But I will also add, sorry, I did, did forget, uh, intersectional. You know, we're an intergenerational movement, but we have yet to be an intersectional movement and intersectionality is such an important, important topic. Um, and last year, you know, with, uh, you know, all that was happening around the social justice movements, uh, it's so important to highlight that intersectionality was something that was, you know, really brought upon the environmental movement, calling uh, environmentalists to be there for Black lives, right? Um, and stand in solidarity and making sure that, you know, the fight for environmental justice and climate justice is intertwined with that of Black lives and the, the lives that are in danger of these inequalities and injustices. So, yeah, I think that in itself is now we're seeing that the movement is becoming in intersectional. And I'm very proud of, to say that, you know, uh, uh, I'm a part of the IE Council member, you know, I'm an IE Council member, which is Intersectional Environmentalist. And they're a huge platform who is, that is working to dismantle the system of repression that is causing these injustices and perpetrating the climate crisis. Thank, well, thank you. you, Kevin and Vassar, for um, sharing your, um, your perspectives on the um, climate activism movement. I'm wondering if, uh, I, you know, Vassar mentioned music as inspiring, and uh, Kevin, you've mentioned um, how you how to use the platforms that you have to engage people on is important issues, the intersectional issues of the environmental movement and the social movements. Can you give our, the audience uh, just a few examples of maybe maybe one example each of kind of an exciting campaign that you ran, ran or how many you know how you engaged uh, maybe a new audience um, in in that? Kevin, why don't you start? First, you know, I've been a part of many campaigns, many, um, you know, um, uh, projects that are focused on creating change and really turning about action and working with communities all around the world. Um, one pro, you know, one campaign that I remember distinctly was just this past election uh, with the Georgia elections where a bunch of young people from throughout the United States kind of came together and started text banking and phone calling, you know, uh, we got around, you know, uh, 20,000 or up to 50,000 texts done in one day. And that was not only that one day, but, you know, continuous days, we got even more done. And that was just so amazing to see that the impact that young people really have if we put their, you know, minds to it and, you know, get that going. But also, uh, you know, we won those two seats, right? Uh, because we really understood that we, we cannot, you know, wait around for climate action. And so we really want to take, you know, young people are really taking this, uh, any chance that they have to really be involved in politics so that they can have a voice and a, a seat at the table. And so I'm very proud to say that's one of the ways that uh, I've seen how young people are really coming together in a campaign that was very successful. Another one is, you know, uh, this is a global campaign that we had uh, with tree plantings, you know, our organization that I run at One Up Action we were able to successfully plant 5,000 trees, which was amazing, um, you know, and throughout the world. And so that was just amazing to see that we have a small group of young kids, you know, young people come together to really set a goal in mind of like, how many trees do we want to plant and making sure that those seeds actually stay alive, right? Um, it was just amazing to see that we were able to come to as a community, a global community and get that done and saying like, that's a small impact, but still it's, it makes a difference in our communities and the places that we're living in. Um, so I went from a national campaign to something that was a little bit more local, but it still makes a huge impact. Great, Ambassador? 
Actually, Kevin's uh, example reminded me of one because I am from Georgia and uh, we've we've been, you know, working um, in the political realm for quite some time. Uh, but this this upcoming election cycle, me and and a group of friends got together uh, to do a fundraiser, a digital fundraiser for Reverend. Well, we to educate on the election coming up and then we raise money for fair count uh stacy abrams organization which uh is uh, we all know what how amazing she has been and we decided to raise money for her instead of uh, specific candidates because she's really working on uh creating a level playing field um especially in a state like georgia that has had a, a long history of voter suppression. And we also did, even though it's COVID, we did a uh, movement with people to show up and physically drop off literature for uh, the candidates. And so we did something similar where you have to use your realm of influence and you have to be strategic in a COVID-19 time on how to be safe in a pandemic, but also take action. Um, with the tools that you have. And so that's something local and then international is, is something that's I've been working on uh, in my campaign and my director title is campaign director for deep sea bed mining, uh, which I we are in uh, this currently and we've been using tools such as letters to the UN and the ISA that anyone can sign on. You can go to the oxygen project back, backslash deep sea bed mining and sign that letter. Uh, and you can also tweet to representatives. We have a whole toolkit on our website. So it's really about how do you be strategic with the tools we have today to be able to drive impact and also uh, create tools for other people to take part in your impact as well. So those are just a couple of examples of what we've been doing. That's great. It really, um, both of the examples that both of you provided really kind of paint a, a picture of the kind of, you know, work and direction and creativity that you're putting into, um, putting into the movement now. So um, I would like to move now to um, hear from our third panelist, Lehua. Can you talk a little bit about your voyaging journey and how you've learned from your ancestors? How might we be able to take inspiration from this intergenerational work that you're doing to solve the climate crisis and protect the ocean? Hello, Kara, and yes, thank you for having me today and uh, Vassar and Kevin for sharing your stories and those examples of the work you do. Um, it might seem like we're in very different <laughs> neighborhoods, but I think absolutely with very um, aligned goals and, and a vision of where we're trying to go with this. Um, so I'm based in, in Honolulu, Hawaii, and I work at the Polynesian Voyaging Society. And a lot of what we are able to do here in open ocean sailing um, on traditional voyaging canoes I think is really helping to remember and redefine some narratives that we hold about our relationship to the ocean, to the earth, and to the other people we share it with. Um, this work really began before I was even around <laughs> uh, uh, and something that I am very fortunate to really inherit from those who came before me. I think um i i felt like somewhat of a youth right up until like this panel where i saw your <laughs> wonderful young faces and energy um but i i think that's just a testament to that this this continues right uh we are the youth and then we are hopefully leaving something for the next generation of youth to be really proud of the work that we did um because as we look around the world we we see what our previous generations valued and where they put their work and where they put their priorities so um, we are, uh, we spend a lot of time on the ocean, uh, practicing, um, traditional navigation, but also how we utilize the platform we have, which is literally, you know, the deck of a canoe, but also 
um, that voice we're able to carry and what stories we lift up. And we have so many examples and uh, histories of Pacific Island people um, from all over the ocean who have had models of sustainability, who have um, carried on, you know, values through many, many generations. And I think a lot of what I feel I do is not maybe even convince anyone that they need to <laughs> think about climate change or think about how to be involved in it. But um, maybe we just are a quick reminder that they already have all the tools that they need um, to figure out what they do from the place they come from. Um, I think we, we sort of live in this, I think, place of, of just inspiring people to go out and find that passion and that connection to the natural world around them in a way they truly can be compassionate about it. Um, if these are not things that we care about, you know, in our own being, it's for me, I, I, I don't even try to say like, you know, all of the science and numbers that you can give someone sometimes kind of go right past them. <laughs> But really, if you're personally invested in, in these things and you see how um, leaving that healthy ocean and that healthy island for the next generation is critically important, um, I think that's where we try to live. And that comes through many forms. Um, it allows, I think, other people to tell their story of what they're doing in an island space. I think it challenges us to think about what we're doing in our own islands uh, right here in Hawaii in the way we go about our work. Um, and intergenerationally is, is a really uh, <laughs> interesting, I think, challenge. Um, I think we can all probably think of conversations we've had with folks who have probably been around longer than us and who might not have the same really driving, um, I suppose, fierceness around what's going on and how you know, they are really part of that solution as well. Uh, one of the things that I hope we share always is, you know, I, I think we believe the solution is in, is in a unity around these ideas. And sometimes you have to listen to the people who are <laughs> most invested in the future of the earth to be reminded that you also have a role in it. And we, and listening to those voices and listening, you know, say, you know, the children have like the most pure, um perspective on things sometimes it's not clouded by other things that get in the way of of the priority so i do hope that part of what we can do is bring together different generations who might sit in different spaces whether they're in business or in policy or simply just you know the parent at home who is thinking about what their child grows up to in 30 40 50 years um, what kind of world they live in we all have a role in reshaping that to a future that we want to see. So, um, and that is definitely not easy work, <laughs> but it, it certainly uh, is something that is, is a theme across all the work we do. Every voyage that we take, you'll see that it, it represents, you know, everyone from the very young to um, generations who have sustained voyaging as a practice, but also who represent perspectives from times where things were a little bit rougher for Hawaii. Um, we have a very, I think, possibly unique story in there uh, in that the actual cultural history of Hawaii was very much um, in a fragile state. Uh, back in the 70s, the actual impetus for the work that we do was sort of kind of saving a lot of the cultural elements that we were losing, both in language and practice and daily life and and holding it back from the brink of extinction. And so that sense and that emotion that you can tie to nearly losing your voice in your language, I think absolutely applies to the feeling of, are we losing the very elements of the world and the ocean and the natural environment that allow us to live and to continue um, to, you know, experience this planet in the way that we want to and in the way that we can thrive. So those are that's my long answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, I think you've, you've touched on um, urgency and also the, um, 
the universal uh, can be universal tie we have across generations for the things that we love and and wanting to kind of inspire that and share that. Um, so thank you for um, for for telling your story. Appreciate appreciate that. Kevin Vassar, I wonder if each, either of you would like to share your perspective also on working intergenerationally to inspire action. You know, intergenerational, um, you know, activism and making sure not this movement of youth the climate movement is not only intergenerational, but intersectional, right? But um, intergenerational activism and working with older generations uh, uh, somewhat in the between and as well as younger generations is such a something that I've been focusing on a lot more because younger generations as well as older generations have to work together uh, in order to implement the solutions, implement these actions and implement the policies needed to fight the disparities, fight the injustices and fight the inequalities that are happening to communities all around the world. And so I would say, you know, first-hand experience is something that I've, you know, been able to work with my mentors. I think adults, older generational people need to be mentors to those that are younger, uh, to mentor them in the, you know, their leadership, their activism, their advocacy towards not only the people that they care about, the planet they love, right, um, but their community. Uh, and that community includes the people and the planet. And um, for me, it's just been so inspirational to see older generations. You know, I started at the age of, um, you know, I always say I started at the age of 12, but I actually started much younger uh, at like the age of, uh, at the age of two or three, because my, my family is, a, a, you know, they come from India, you know, they migrated here and they're climate migrants, um, having a farming background. And they themselves, you know, uh, ingrained in me, you know, that we can plant our own food and stuff like that. And living in South Central Los Angeles has taught me that food apartheid is something huge, uh, food deserts and food prisons. Uh, and I just saw how inspirational all the older generational leaders were, like Ron Finley, Vanda Nashiva, who is in India, uh, and other inspirational leaders who are working around these issues of making sure that we're not only fighting for our community, but we're fighting against the companies and corporations who are trying to, you know, destroy, uh, you know, the plants and animal species that we have on our earth. And, um, you know, I would say it's been inspirational to see these people and being able to even interact with them and talk to them and having them be my mentors. And so um, being that said, you know, uh, going growing up and seeing all of that happen, um, it's just been very, very inspirational and having people, um, you know, be mentors to these young leaders is something that I would say is very much needed, but not only mentorship, it's also about, um, you know, a lot of people who have privilege and have funding and access to connections and stuff like that. I think that's also something that young people are always looking for because that drives the change and dri drives the action that is needed to really make change happen. Um, I know without the connections I would have in LA County, I would have never been able to pass the first ever Youth Climate Commission. It's never been done before. It's the first ever in the world. And it really gives a seat for young people in all 88 cities in LA County, a seat at the table to really discuss what they need for their communities and what they need in the sense of climate action. Uh, and so I'm very proud to say that, you know, young older generations and younger generations need to work together to bring upon, bring upon change because younger generations are very innovative and they are bringing the solutions. A lot of them are already being impacted by the climate crisis and they worry about their futures, but not only about their futures for the next seven generations as well. And so I think having older generations and younger generations working and having this movement be intergenerational is a way that we're really gonna solve this issue of the climate crisis. Um, and I that uh, that's basically my answer for that. I do apologize for taking so long. Oh no, thank you, Kevin. You're amazing, and and something that always gets me uh, is coming on panels like this and and getting to hear what Kevin and what Lahua and uh, what Kira are doing. Uh, for me, the intergenerational conversation started. Uh, within my own family unit. And that's really how I 
have the values I have today and why I do the work I have today. And where I've really seen that the importance of the wisdom and the leadership and the advice coming from an older generation and how it helps the youth uh, really develop a strategy and become passionate ourselves. And so I've taken that into my own life and, and like Kevin surrounded myself um, intentionally with, with wisdom and with advice and with mentors uh, to really be able to do this work um, and, and I don't think you really can do it w without that intergenerational conversation, um, and support. And, and I think that can be taken into the larger context of even solving climate, cri the climate crisis. So, just for an example, and uh, we, uh, with the sustainable ocean Alliance to do a summit on deep sea bed mining called defend the deep global youth mobilizing to protect the deep sea and even though it was it was very concentrated on mobilizing the youth uh, a big theme and our other partner was uh, the ocean elders because we knew we can't solve the climate crisis without elders present um and actually and i know thompson lahua he was our keynote opening keynote speaker um which really was amazing but the the conversation that was one of my favorites to take away was this intergenerational conversation uh and you saw the advice unfolding and we we're very intentional of having that panel and having that conversation between young ocean leaders from france and peru who are working on this issue and uh ocean elders like dr sylvia earl and sven limblad who one represent an amazing, you know, ocean pioneer and and uh, and marine biologist, and uh, Sven Lindblad, who represents business and ocean and exploration. Uh, two very different perspectives that are invaluable to young ocean leaders trying to do work to defend a healthy ecosystem. So I think having these conversations, if you are a young climate activist yourself is going to make you more resilient, is going to, uh, you know, help your work be more successful. But also if, you know, there are uh, young climate leaders out there that maybe are just starting and don't know who to go to, don't know who that mentor should be, you could reach out to anyone on social media. Um, you could reach out, I'm sure, to Kevin or me. I know Kevin's so busy, um, but also, look to panels like this or or uh you know panels like our uh intergenerational panel or you know you can access people digitally online and hear their stories and become inspired by that i know sylvia Earl has so much airtime um these days and and through her channels and and so i really would like to emphasize just this intergenerational and as kevin said intersectional it's so important to have everyone's voices represented at the table. That's the only way we're gonna drive these solutions and really be able to uh, defend all ecosystems and create solutions um, for everyone on the planet. If I might add on, I just wanted to say, you know, follow uh, the Oxygen Project, follow pages, you know, such as Intersectional Environmentalists on Instagram and all social media platforms. Also one of action, if you're a young leader that is wanting to take action and, you know, have the resources um to really take action um yeah there's a, a lot of amazing organizations that are doing this amazing work on different topics and uh different issues so just explore the realms of you know these different organizations i know bank of the west and uh grounded are doing amazing work as well so check them out as well and um yeah just uh, there's so many organizations out there that are doing this important work so please 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 be on the lookout for those great thank you Lahua, can you share a little bit more about uh, the work that you're doing with your organization, how you're inspiring youth um, to engage in your program and other programs also? Thank you, Kara. Um, yes, and I think, you know, I really do want to recognize what Kevin and what Vassar said about their inspiration through their upbringing, you know, through your parents, through your families, to the generations that came before you. Um, it reminds us that, you know, youth and children are watching 
they're listening, you know, they're seeing what you're saying. They're, they're seeing how you're spending your time, your resources, what you're using your voice to uplift, how you use your platform to shine certain issues into light. And, you know, you're seeing that in both of you and in so many that are part of these movements. Um, so wherever we may be in this journey, you know, that, that youth climate action movement really does include everyone and we do all, all have these roles. And even if we're, you know, in our 70s, 80s and 90s, you know, the younger still watching and seeing how you're, how you're being part of the solution and what things, you know, we can learn from. And I really want to celebrate that you've created a pathway and um, tools, so many ways for people to be part of that solution and that journey. I think the term climate change just is like this overwhelming ocean of, of issues, but you know, talk about how many opportunities there are to be part of that solution in so many ways. So thank you for finding so many um, engagement points there. Um, for us, I, I, I remember a few years ago, <laughs> I would say how many, um, these conversations about climate and environmental concerns about what was going on with the ocean around us, what was going on with our weather systems. Um, there was a lot of talk that was very, very dark and actually quite depressing at times. And I think a lot of folks in the sector that were trying to speak, you know, more attention to it were finding you know, a hard time seeing a pathway forward. And I think your voices have been inspiring and so powerful to remind us also in many ways that, you know, <laughs> it felt like for a time people were throwing up their hands, like there's just no solution to it, you know, it's it's over. And a lot of that is maybe we're just not listening to enough people or the right people. Maybe we need to focus some attention where it not, if we haven't been, you know, lending an ear and, and that light. And I, I hope that part of the work that we are able to do um, with our platform is bring out more of those voices and more of those experiences and more of how every day um, a young woman in Micronesia might be trying to find a solution to how her children um, are going to be raised in the values of her ancestors. I hope that um, by using a platform of this voyage, we are able to both directly connect people around common issues. Um, for me, living in the middle of the ocean, it's so easy to say, you know, the ocean is this huge connector. We have, if, if we don't have common ground in this, this vast ocean space, we are all very much directly invested in the health of this place. It's where our food comes from. It's where the rain and the weather that, you know, brings food to our islands comes from and so there are so many so many different narratives that bring light to that and bring hope and inspiration and challenges for solutions on islands um, a common theme that i've found as we've sailed around the world is this uh <laughs> this recognition that a little canoe is a little bit like a like an island and a little island is a lot like the whole world and how we treat one another and the resources that we have, you know, when we take something, someone else probably doesn't have that. And so it's, it's this recognition that everything comes from somewhere um, and from something and someone. And it, we might not even see it in our generation. Um, and, you know, Vassar talking about deep sea mining, you know, where, where do we draw lines in, in where we maybe rethink what we need right now and what the future may need and how we're changing the trajectory of that future. Um, so we spend quite a bit of time, I think, um, talking and listening with our communities when we travel, hearing what they have to say, hearing where they are, seeing ways that their voice is part of the story. Um, I would hate if at the end of the voyage, only the only thing that anyone learned was like my personal story of, of sailing this canoe. I, I really hope that, um, well, some of the tension tends to be like this incredible ocean journey that we bring upon the deck of our canoe and onto the platforms, whether they are through social media or through um, stories, you know, that people see in film. Um, we're following the blogs in the various ways we can communicate these stories. Um, 
that this voice and these stories are actually coming from our ancestors. And we're just here right now for this short time, carrying on legacies of creating a healthy planet for the future. And I've just found so many, so many parallels, so many similar stories, so many struggles of just, you know, no one ever listened to us before. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh, you know, that's, that's the first step um, and finding avenues for that, that voice to be shared um, and seeing that every, every voice in action is part of this movement. And if there was ever a time to, for everyone to get on board, <laughs> right now might be it. Now's the time. Yeah. Wonderful. So, I mean, um, just thinking about um, the ways in each of you, each of you have like kind of brought more people into what you're doing and inspiring them, which you've certainly shared a lot of that today. Um, can maybe starting um, with Lahua, do you see a direct, um, this is a question from our audience, do you see a direct translation from your activism um, on the front lines um, with Capitol Hill and legislators? How are you seeing that translated? Boy, uh, that's a big one. Um, I think for me, um, from from the space um, that we operate in here out on the water, Capitol Hill feels very far from Hawaii. Let's just say that. <laughs> it feels very far from this ocean space. And in so many ways, I feel like I focus my energy on recognizing the leadership and the power of the individual communities that I hope we serve. And um, we don't generally have a specific policy sort of, uh, I suppose, department <laughs> that campaigns uh, on that behalf. Um, I think the ways that we hope it is changed is, is through partnerships. Um, you know, I like to focus on the ways that I connect people to the real connections they have to the ocean space. And we're very lucky to have so many friends and supporters who really know that political space <laughs> and who know how, um, how stories like this can be uh, transformational when we speak at a United Nations summit or how this starts to change local policy um, because it comes from the community itself. And so in many ways, I feel we're always working sort of <laughs> ground up. <laughs> um, and uh, Capitol Hill is a little challenging to keep up with, I'll say, especially <laughs> in the last few months and, and few years where it does feel like the the national narrative, certainly within the U.S., has been, you know, entirely not about the environment. Um, and there was such a strong, you know, renewed resolve towards purpose about four years ago when it felt like that whole, um, that whole chapter and that whole uh, work just sort of fell off of, of the national conversation. And what's grown from that is so much more passion and innovation around how we address the issue. Um, and I think we tend to focus a lot more in just these, these you know, communities that can't be divided by political lines. And we all know they, that's, that's such a powerful strength that we are able to have. Right. Thank you for that. Um, that's right. I don't know if in your, your organization, uh, maybe you could give us um, an example of how you're working um, to change policy or influence policy. So very specifically, I'm working on the Deep Sea by Mining campaign, which is an international um, under the International Seabed Authority. It's an autonomous uh, governing body created by the United Nations and what's going to allow them to pass uh, legislation and what they're hoping to be is 2021 will basically allow um, a gold rush and a land grab of our international waters. And actually Lahua, uh, as she said, and, and she's in Hawaii, so she would probably know that the CZZ 
the CCZ is the first area of the ocean that these uh, miners are going for, and they're actually already licensed to be able to mine there. They, this legislation just has to pass first. So what we do is we're uh, really advocating for a tenure, at least a tenure moratorium on deep sea bed mining, uh, and we are educating as well. And we do things, we work with a coalition, we work across uh, the world with other organizations who are also doing this work, especially uh, organizations in the Pacific who have been on the front lines of deep sea bed mining for years. Uh, this is not something new to them, but it is a topic that's new to the rest of the world, which isn't surprising. So trying to elevate these voices from the front lines um, and we, we had uh, frontliners from the Cook Islands and the Seychelles uh, speak at our uh, summit um, in December, uh, but elevating those voices and really working more so in the international policy realm. But now that the US uh, has changed administrations, it will be something uh, that we do have to make sure is not part of the Green New Deal. Um, that that deep sea bed mining is not the future of sustainability. Uh, it's going for rare earth minerals, but the future of sustainability is a circular economy and truly sustainable solutions that both solve for the climate crisis, uh, also are equitable, and also defend our remaining pristine ecosystems. Because if we don't have a healthy ocean, we don't have nine years to save the planet. The ocean is the the buffer giving the nine years for us to be able to have time to create solutions. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's the work I do. Not, not really anything specific in, in policy in the U S yet, but, um, there's definitely potential for that to come. And really right now we're focusing on, um, you know, how do we elevate, uh, the front lines and how do we, um, work at this in an, in an international realm. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think any kind of ground up work, any kind of um, education, mobilizing people uh, to inform the policies, absolutely essential. Um, and that pressure that many people, the more people that are thinking about it and that it's important to, the more uh, that we can influence policy. Kevin, you had mentioned that, you know, you had worked in Los Angeles, you've done some commission work. Can you share maybe some thoughts on your work uh, kind of at the local uh, policy level and, and how and if and how you've seen that translate, um, you know, to the state or uh, nationally, internationally? Of course. And, uh, you know, not only in local politics, um, you know, I've worked in L.A. City specifically, which is only one city in L.A. County. Uh, to work on idling, batting at idling because it causes a lot of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the air and smog pollution that ravages Los Angeles. So I've done policy work on the local level with my city, but I also have done work in the county level, which is all 88 cities and, uh, you know, in LA County, which again, uh, LA County is uh, one of, it's the most low, it's one of the most powerful local governments in our nation because of the size of the population and just the amount of people you know and communities that are here um and being able to see that and being able to really work in policy and making crafting motions to um really bring about change and making sure that young people are included in the conversation around climate uh and what and how to really implement the solutions and what solutions that they want to be implementing within um you know our communities that we're living in it's been a very, you know, it's been an uphill battle, but I, I am proud to say that, you know, again, in LA County, I was able to pass the Youth Climate Commission, uh, which is, uh, again, all over 88 cities, which is amazing, and giving young people not only the voice, but the decision making power of what happens, and trying to replicate that, uh, not only within the United States, but globally, and working with organizations like C40 and other um, nonprofit organizations and uh, corporations as well as to make sure that young people are included in these conversations. Um, it is a, you know, I think one of the things is that uh, very much young people are really not included in these decision making, right? They're not really included in policy or uh, not being able to really uh, take action and or have a voice, have their voices heard in policy. And that's a little bit what's shifting now is that we're really wanting to hear from the young people and 
hear from us as in the, in the sense of like what needs to be implemented in the solutions. Um, uh, you know, we're a lot of like a lot of the young people, for example, are working on youth in government, which is making sure that the Biden administration includes uh, Gen Z and young people and within government. So I just, you know, I think the only tactics we have had are systematic action, but now we're actually now, you know, shifting and making sure that our voices are not only heard, but are in these, um, you know, in these spaces that are making the decisions on behalf of our futures. Great, so we have had over 70 um, participants today on, uh, and I imagine a number of them are uh, youth that want to get involved. So I'd like each of you just to share something that might be upcoming that you're involved in and uh, how our audience here today might be invited to join you in that. So um, starting with you, Kevin, um, is there some event or some action that you're that's upcoming that you'd like to invite people to? Of course, I'm not able to share too much, but Earth Day, you know, this year marked the 51st anniversary of Earth Day. Yeah, last year was the 50th anniversary, which was amazing. But this year is, again, renewing our vows, of, you know, making sure that we're not only talking about climate, but already taking action and implementing the solutions that are already there. And um, so I would say check out, you know, all the organizations again, but check out One Up Action if you're interested in getting resources or even getting involved with youth activism and having the toolkits and help and funding and stuff like that to make sure you're, uh, uh, you know, taking action within your own community. We work around, uh, we work internationally. So we have about 30 global chapters. Uh, we have 30, we work in 35 different countries, which is amazing. And we are now really focusing on domestic, uh, you know, our, uh, domestically a lot more. And so we're really working with colleges as well, but stay tuned for a huge campaign uh, coming on Earth Day, that's all I can say, but there's gonna be huge partners involved in it. I'm intrigued. Um, I'll be watching for that. Lahua, who would you, what are you doing and who would you like to invite? Um, well, uh, we, we do voyaging, so we are getting ready for another um, voyage out onto the water into the, the beautiful Pacific Ocean. Um, and that's going to take us a few years um, and, and traveling through many of the nations and countries and communities that absolutely have an invested interest in the health of our oceans. Um, and we're going to be opening up a platform for everyone to be part of that, to share stories um, and to get engaged with our, our communities that are really driving the action um, from this I think this realization and this rewriting of the narrative of our own responsibilities to this ocean space and and what we're going to do to to build that future ocean. So, um, yeah, we'll be uh, sharing that out probably shortly. Also, uh, like Kevin said, we're getting it already getting all organized, trying to make the most of our various COVID lockdowns and um, reconnecting with communities. So that'll be upcoming uh, later this year. Great. And Vassar? So I think I mentioned this earlier. I have a letter to the UN and international representatives on our website at the oxygen project backslash deep sea mining. We would love for everyone to sign that because the signatures help us do the work uh, that's that's mostly behind the scenes. Um, and that letter we created with the sustainable ocean alliance. And hopefully we'll have some really exciting news to share soon too. Uh, just keep an eye out uh, for World Oceans Day. And uh, in the meantime, we would love your support by signing the letter, going to our toolkit and following us on socials. And please follow my other friends on the panel too, because I couldn't do the work I'm doing in, in my niche um, every day if I, couldn't hear that everyone else is doing the work and their niches everywhere. It gives you a sense of ease and and hopefulness that you know all of us together are really going to be able to make larger systems shifts and and impacts. So thank you guys for doing what you do and everyone go support them. 
Wonderful. So we are getting close to the end here. The hour went by quickly. Um, I just want to thank our panelists and um, all of our participants. And again, our hosts and organizers, uh, Grounded and Bank of the West for um, being part um, of this discussion. It's just the beginning of a discussion. I think that you, everyone here has been invited to work with Kevin and Lahua and Vassar on some really amazing initiatives. I'm sure in your own communities, um, there's many things going on and welcome open arms for people that want to engage and participate in this. Um, so I don't want to be the last word for this panel. Um, maybe uh, each each of you can just, um, you know, say goodbye and share your one last word for this group or um, and uh, and we'll close out. So Vassar. I saw someone put in the questions, um, you know, do you have to uh, can you take actions that are outside of pushing for policy? Can you do individual actions that aren't or uh, that aren't just about system change? And I, I think it's really important to take those actions uh, personally because it makes you uh, more resilient and makes you more, you know, standing in line with your beliefs. Sometimes um, things get in the way uh, when it comes to plastic and it's actually a good thing because then you realize how big uh, of a systems change that's needed to happen. But all of those individual actions are actually really important for you as a climate activist and building that resiliency. So I would say absolutely yes. Um, you don't have to do just policy. You can get creative like I was talking about earlier. Whatever your skill set is, whatever you're passionate about, can uh, have a plug in to solving a, a niche part of the climate crisis. So I just want to encourage anyone out there, if you're an artist or if you care about educating women and girls, those things have uh, have a big role to play in solving for the climate crisis. So just find what you're passionate about. Find some friends who are also passionate about climate, and that will help you get started. Uh, and and just get creative and and it's a perfect opportunity to do so because we're in a pandemic and there are a lot of tools at your fingertips. So I just encourage you to get started and don't get too bogged down about how how big the climate crisis is because there are people uh, doing this work or you could just plug into the tool. People have like become part of one up action. I'm always inspired by Kevin um, find you might not be able to you know, uh, participate in this voyage with Lahua, but you could follow along, I'm sure, um, or find something that's more local to your community that uh, really needs resolving. Um, because those those small actions are really collaboratively what's going to solve the climate crisis. So, thank you guys. Thank you, Bank of the West. Thank you, Grounded. Thank you, Vassar. And we are at 11:01, but I do want Lahua and. Kevin, just to share 15 seconds, um, a goodbye to the group. Of course, and I just want to thank Grounded and um, Bank of the West. On that note of what Vassar said, and you know, we're not taking actions in our daily lives and in our in our communities. How are we expected to have our you know leaders and world leaders to do the same, right? To, to take action. So I think it's so so important that we individually take that action within our own community to you know make sure that we solve these injustices and these inequalities that are happening to our fellow uh, community members that we all love and support, right? Thanks, Kevin. And Lahua. Just wanna echo what Kevin and Vassar said, um, you know, those words. If there's anything I've learned in my years on the ocean and hanging out here on this little island, every single thing is connected. So no matter where you're living, no matter what you're doing, you know, everything I put into the ocean or take out of it affects everyone else on this planet. So um, no matter how small you think it is, it, it makes a difference in, in this ocean and this world that we're leaving behind. So. Well, fantastic. Thank you everyone for joining us. Great to meet you, all of you, and uh, looking forward to working with you. Um,